This video is sponsored by Squarespace. It's just not possible to continue like this, and he knows that. Gunter Steiner did not mince his words when talking about one of his drivers ahead of round eight of this 2022 F1 season. From one side of the garage, has had zero points, multiple extensive crash damage bills, and a driver seemingly really low on confidence. There's a lot of opinions out there, and for me, I'm not absolutely 100% certain where I sit. So I thought we'd collate it all, bring it all together, look at all the pros and all the cons, and come up with a reasonable conclusion of what should happen with Mick Schumacher. Should he stay at Haas? I'm sure we can get to a conclusion that we all agree with, right? My name's Tomo, like and subscribe, and let's talk about it. So let's start with a point that I've made numerous times over the course of, of this season, which is that should we really be considering this as more of Mick's rookie season than 2021? Hear me out. Last year, he had a hopeless teammate in a car that was miles off the back of the pack. It was very difficult for Mick to make any kind of reasonable impression within the paddock or with us as fans, right? Like sure, he consistently outperformed, outqualified his teammate, but... So what, that wasn't really much to write home about given the calibre. If I nutmeg your mum, does that make me Erling Haaland? No. Now, when you compare Mick's 2021 to Yuki Tsunoda's 2021, both rookies that year, I would argue that Yuki gained 100% of the possible experience that you can from a rookie season. Really, really capable teammates set in a standard that you can look up to. A good, solid midfield car that you can battle, scrap with, do something with in qualifying and you're at a team that is known for developing young Formula One drivers, has an incredible track record with it. Mick didn't have any of those things in 2021, I think that's fair to say. Now, yes, of course, there was still value to him being there. He got to follow the F1 circus around, practice sessions, qualifying races, learning from the team. He did have the odd wheel-to-wheel -wheel scrap look at Hungary when Max had half of his car missing and then it was kind of on Haas pace, actually still quicker. <laughs> I'm not saying there was no value to Mick's 2021 season, but I am saying that there was definitely less value than he would have otherwise gained if he was in an Alpha Tauri like Yuki was, if he was in an Alpha Romeo that Shah was, in a Toro Rosso that Max was when he started, etc, etc. So yeah, I do think this kind of faux rookie season is worth bearing in mind when we're analysing Mick Schumacher's performances but what i will also bear in mind regarding today's video sponsor squarespace is you can be a complete rookie to website design yet squarespace will help you build your very own beautiful online home it will hold your hand with a plethora of award-winning drag and drop templates and you won't be fox smashing doors like gunter because they've got 24 7 customer support whenever you need them they're there think of squarespace like a prime toto wolf think of i guess gunter is a bit more pixo if you know you know that's a throwback isn't it give it a go it's free of charge until you want to put your website live to the world as well so there's nothing to lose in trying it out and when that time comes head to squarespace.com slash tomof1 to save 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain okay so let's talk about mix raw pace because this is arguably the most important factor as a formula one driver top team principals will always say they'd rather a driver that's you know, guilty of going 101, 102% slightly overstepping the mark than someone who can't even get up there in the first place, you know. So I think the best way of looking at this is comparing his qualifying deltas relative to Kevin Magnussen. Obviously, in the race, there's so many factors that determine your position and different strategies and all that. Qualifying, in terms of raw pace, that is the best metric to be looking at and I think Kevin Magnussen's a really good benchmark to hold this man has plenty of F1 experience and I think his pace I think his pace goes under the radar I think Kevin's a very very quick driver so what I've done is compare their relative qualifying times from the best session that both drivers made okay so say both get knocked out in Q1 we compare their Q1 times if they both get to Q2 we compare their Q2 times but if only one gets to Q2 then we'll just compare the Q1 times. That's the fairest because obviously track conditions are gonna be as similar as possible, right? So their total gap over 18 rounds of this 2022 Formula One season, KMAG has gone 5.366 seconds quicker than Mick Schumacher, which sounds like a lot. However, you need to divide that by 18 to get the average, and that comes out at a much more respectable, I think, 0.298 seconds. Is Mick behind? Yes. Is that great? No. But an average of 0.3 against a teammate of Kevin's quality, again, in his eighth season of Formula One, remember? Spread across three different teams, had experience in sport cars. He wasn't just sitting on his ass in 2021 not doing anything. He was racing in IMSA and doing a bloody good job on that. 2022 was a new car for everyone, and if 
if anything, that bit of different experience for Kevin might have even stood him in better stead to jump into these new cars. And he was at Haas before he left anyway. So he's already got the relationship with that team. They already know what they're dealing with. So for me, Mick was never going to come in and beat Kevin Magnussen. I did not believe that was going to happen at all. And it hasn't. But also those numbers don't tell the full story because if you look at the first nine races of the season and the second nine races of the season, the average gap is very, very different. The first nine races averaged a 0.433 delta, which is pretty significant okay once you get above 0.3 that's when it's a bit like concerning but the remaining nine races so the most recent nine which again if we're going to look at a driver as developing and, and as a young driver growing right into a team into a car into the sport you have to look at the more recent results with more scrutiny i'd say and that average gap in the last nine has only been 0.163 seconds which is way more respectable yes he's behind but he's also had a few dubs over kevin in qualifying it's not been a whitewash by any stretch of the imagination but yeah let me know in the comments below is this gap big or smaller or about what you kind of expected it to be i'll be interested to hear oh and subscribe your mugs now of course we can't go any longer in this video and not address the clear elephant in the room which is the biggest issue the biggest problem for mick schumacher which is the frequency of shunts this season we've had three big high profile shunts from Mick, that's one in six Grand Prix, which doesn't sound great when you put it like that, I suppose. We had that huge, really scary shunt into the concrete wall at Jeddah in Q2 while he was pushing, just overstepped the mark, got on the sausage curb and bang. Another shunt in Monaco where he seemed to just veer ever so slightly off that drying line where the rest of the track was still damp. That caused the car to spin, hit the wall, split the car in half, which is what it's designed to do, but it certainly looked dramatic. And then the race just gone in Japan at the Dunlop curve, seemed to aquaplane, which again, when it's aquaplaning, it's hard to give too much criticism to the driver. I mean, that's not a turn where there's any real load on the car. It's a long kind of progressive corner where you're just pinned full throttle. But also it was after the session FP1 had finished. So was Mick taking unnecessary risk going as fast as he was? maybe but also i don't know what it's like to drive an f1 car in the rain on wet tires when there's rivers of water coming across the track so maybe he did everything right and just got unlucky now obviously his teammate kevin has had his fair share of incidents but have they resulted in the car getting written off no it's basically the fact that his front wing end plates for some reason maybe it's it's budgetary are made out of paper mache so as soon as anyone like breathes at them they just go like that and then the black and orange flag comes out. Kevin Magnussen must have nightmares about that meatball flag, I swear to God. You know the episode of The Office when Jim and Stanley keep putting meatballs in Dwight's um, desk? That's basically Kevin Magnussen's worst nightmare. I don't think there would be as much concern. There would for sure still be concern, but not as much concern if it wasn't for the fact that last year, he also had a lot of crashes then. Monaco FP3 into the wall. Hungary FP3 into the wall. France Q1 into the wall i could go on in fact don't listen to me check out racing statistics 2021 destructors championship video link above and in the description does a really good job at estimating looking at all the cars all of the drivers and seeing who caused the most damage in 2021 and who won it's mick yeah sorry mick you won that one almost five million dollars worth of damage to your car and that's almost twice as much as the damage that his teammate caused who was getting memed left right and center and rightly so because driver shunting is a problem but now i think we need to talk more about the team specifically because there are some bespoke issues here depending on where you are in the grid what kind of team you're racing for having a lot of shunts but having some decent pace can be more or less tolerated but the problem for Mick is if he is causing damage, if he is causing big repair bills, Haas are probably the leanest team in Formula One. They're probably operating on the lowest budget because we know it's almost guaranteed they're not at the cost cap. Now, in some ways, it's kind of good for Haas because does the cost cap really make any difference to them? No, they're already under that 145 million that it was for last year anyway, so they can just carry on as if nothing's changed. But they are still operating at a disadvantage relative to the rest of the grid financially. Again, so let's say it's 110 million, for example. I've heard that number bounded around a bit. That still leaves them $35 million short of everyone else, which would pay for all of Mick's shunts last year seven times over. So any money it has that isn't going towards car development is exponentially hurting them more 
when it is going to crash damage. If you write off a Haas and you write off a Red Bull, that's probably costing about the same amount to rebuild the car. It's just that the design is fundamentally weaker for Haas. Then when you also take into account where Haas are, which is kind of the bottom end of the midfield where most weekends there is an outside shot they'll get into the points on certain tracks as well they're much stronger and they're you know we've seen them both in q3 in like austria for example you're at the fringes you need to be making the most of every opportunity that presents itself and by that stretch you kind of need two drivers who are reliable and consistent more so than a luxury driver, right? Who has this incredible pace, but might shunt it. Now you can definitely argue that Mick doesn't have incredible pace, yet he still does have the shunts. And I guess that's part of the problem. They need reliability. They need consistency from their drivers. They need insight as well to help develop the car that comes from experience. And Mick hasn't been ticking a lot of those boxes, especially when you consider there are alternatives out there. There'll always be drivers chomping at the bit to get in Formula One, of course. But it is looking like if Mick doesn't get that 2023 seat, there are two drivers who seem most likely to step in, Antonio Giovinazzi or Nico Hülkenberg. Antonio had an okay stint in Formula One, three years alongside Kimi Raikkonen, typically quicker than Kimi in qualifying, but typically slower in the race. And there were numerous opportunities that Antonio had. Really good off the starts as well. Antonio always seemed to have a good getaway. He did out-qualify Kimi, but then finished behind him, which is never a good look. Certainly debatable whether he would outpace Mick. What do you think? Do you think he would outpace Mick Schumacher? Giovinazzi Schumacher in qualifying head-to-head. -head. But then you've also got to look at the off-track stuff. So he is a Ferrari reserve driver. He is Italian. Haas and Ferrari have a super close relationship, even closer since Haas set up their Maranello base as well. 28 years old as well. So plenty of time left in the tank for him to carry on and be a more kind of long-term. He's actually younger than K-Mag. So a Giovinazzi K-Mag lineup could be something that has to stick with and, and have some stability for some years, which I think should in theory be a good thing, as long as they don't keep crashing into each other like Grosjean and Magnussen were, I suppose. And then Nico Hülkenberg, a man who massively divides opinion. Like it is quite interesting variety of takes we get when it regards uh, Nico Hülkenberg, a man who's had 10 seasons in Formula One, remember, with five pretty damn impressive one-off appearances over the course of 2020 and 2022. Don't forget Singapore putting it P3, mate. Singapore? Silverstone. I meant to say Silverstone, I said Singapore. Weird. Winner of the 24-hour Le Mans in 2015, 35-year-old, certainly wouldn't be the same long-term option like a Giovinazzi or a Schumacher. But I do think that Nico would do a better job than both of them. I think he'd be a safer and quicker set of hands. Now, I know Kevin Magnussen told Nico to suck his balls. Won't they beef as teammates? Well, look, come on. Is it really that deep? I'm sure I like to think as two grown adults, they're not crying about that anymore, okay? This is not drama. This is Formula One. This is sport. And also one last point on options, I guess, which kind of stands against Mick is that it is being heavily rumoured that he will be dropped from the FDA, the Ferrari Driver Academy. Now he is still showing on their website at the time of recording. So that is definitely not confirmed, but it was that Ferrari connection and, you know, lining him up for the future teammate alongside Leclerc that even Bonato was talking about right that's what helped get Schumacher in the door at Haas and that relationship with Ferrari is why it was Haas in the end so if he was to leave the academy that would certainly make his position weaker especially as one of those options to replace him is Giovinazzi who is still a Ferrari driver another point I want to talk about with Mick I think is his name because this is something we don't typically need to talk about but I think there is a, a degree of, of relevance here uh, it's not every week you get a Bruno Senna a Nelson Piquet Jr or a Mick Schumacher in the sport. I think it goes both ways. I think carrying that Schumacher name is as much of a blessing as it maybe is a curse as well. The Schumacher name is always gonna bring him attention and sponsorship, which is always gonna stand him in good stead in motorsport where you need money. And perhaps he does get softer treatment from certain fans, people who idolized Michael Schumacher growing up, maybe look at Mick and give him a bit more benefit of the doubt than most others would. Scrutinize his performance through rose-tinted spectacles, Maybe that is a thing. I'm sure that is to an extent. But then there's the increased expectation, the attention, the eyeballs that are going to be on Mick. He didn't run Schumacher as his surname when he was coming through the ranks in karting for a reason. But the reality is he's always going to be compared to his old man. And when Michael jumped into the sport in that Jordan around Spa and put it P7 in qualifying, he made an impression. Impression we don't typically see. We see that from, you know, Sebastian Vettel when he jumped into that Sauber, from Lewis Hamilton when he jumped into that McLaren. And they all went on to win multiple world titles. Now, I think it's fair to say from what we've seen of Mick Schumacher, he's not at that calibre. He's not going to do that. 
And that chip on his shoulder, especially given, you know, what kind of happened to his dad and he hasn't got his dad there and his support to kind of help him through this is really sad, to be honest. And I'm sure it's not that widespread, but you do get the whole, oh, you're only here because of your name brigade, which I think is really harsh. Like he won Formula 2 in his second season, like, come on. So then if Haas elect to not go with Mick, could there be an option elsewhere? Because there is one other seat available we know it's available it's confirmed that Alex Albon will be in that Williams seat for 2023 and Nicholas Latifi will not be in that seat so could Mick jump in at Williams Jos Capito Williams team principal has gone on record and said Mick is an option he also deserves to stay in Formula One we'll see if that happens he's definitely an option for us and also another Williams option Nick De Vries is confirmed at Alpha Tauri so maybe that makes Schumacher's opportunity bigger the problem for him is a certain American by the name of Logan Sargent. Because with De Vries now out the picture, I think Logan is for sure their number one option. He might have been their number one option all along, to be honest. The 21-year-old from Fort Lauderdale in Florida pushed Taylor Pochier and Oscar Piastri all the way in the 2020 Formula 3 title battle. He's had a quality rookie season in Formula 2, his best rookie so far. Now, he has only won two races all year and had six retirements, but for him to be sitting P3 in the championship surely only speaks for his consistency. Like, I was looking into it, right? He's been classified as completing 20 races so far this season. So that includes sprints and feature races. You qualify for the feature race and then it's reverse grid for the sprint. So if you do well in qualifying, you're going to have a tougher time in the sprint race. Yet in those 20 races he's finished, Logan has only been outside the top 10 once all year and that was a p12 in the Jeddah feature race which from what i remember was a bit of a madness now of course he's already a williams junior and williams would love to promote internally right i don't know if they wanted mick schumacher if there would be some kind of fee attached to it so for example alpine have paid 10 million euros i think uh, to alpha tari for pierre gasly services from next year onwards but then of course there is another big factor which is again the fact that he's american he would be the first american on the f1 grid since alexander rossi now indycar logan would be the first american since drive to survive began the first of that era and we know how much of an impact that's had on the american audience i'm sure plenty of you watching found f1 through drive to survive and plenty of you are american i know that i see the analytics there's almost more of you than there are british bias people mate calm down you americans Right, chill out. I'm surprised you can even understand me, to be honest. Now, will the fact that he's American make up for the fact that he will probably, if he gets the Williams seat next year, be in one of the worst cars on the grid? No. I, I think having a competitive car, if you're really going to get national full-on support, I think you need to be in competitive machinery. I don't think your nationality is enough. But you know full well there will be US-based companies who will be looking to support and sponsor the first US Formula 1 driver of this new F1 era, right? That's going to be a good thing for Williams. And arguably, that might even bring more in commercially than having Mick Schumacher. Well, I would say actually probably it would. The only issue for Logan is that it's not a guaranteed thing. He needs to finish this Formula 2 season in the top six and not get any penalty points in this final race of the year at Abu Dhabi. Basically, I didn't know this. If you don't score any penalty points in Formula 2, and Logan is the only driver, I think, who hasn't all season... You get an extra two super license points. P6, doing FP1 in Austin, which he is for Williams, and getting those extra two super license points would get him exactly to the 40 that he needs. And look, we know from the Colton Hurt situation, the FIA are not prepared to negotiate on this. You either have the super license points so you can get a super license and race in F1, or you don't. Now, it's currently P3 on 135 points. He's nine points ahead of Jehan Darivala, Enzo Fittipaldi, and Jack Doohan, who all sit on 126. So it's very unlikely that he misses out. Okay, he'd have to have an absolute shocker of a weekend and they would all have to have absolute worldies, but it, it could happen. As we saw in Suzuka, you know, Max and Red Bull were not prepared to celebrate a title win until it was mathematically impossible for them to lose out. When they did realise it was mathematically impossible for them to lose out, then they celebrated and Williams will do the same. They're not going to announce Sargent when it's not guaranteed he's got enough super license points. And then for Williams, I guess, if Logan doesn't get the super license and if Mick does re-sign with Haas, then who would Williams go with? I don't even know. I ain't got Scooby. Let me know. 
But yeah, what do you think? Thoughts and feelings below. I think it's a tough choice, right? But if I'm Gunter Steiner, I think I'm probably speaking to Nico Hulkenberg first. If I could get Nico on a minimum two-year deal, so that's 2023 and 2024, I would probably go for him. Alongside K-Mag, you've got two drivers dripping with experience, and I think they would bring the car home more often than not and push the car development forward. And then in two years, if Hulkenberg wants to hang up his boots, then there's probably going to be an exciting new prospect that you can maybe try out. I just don't think Mick's shown enough to be like guaranteed and, and owed that opportunity. But if they can only get Nico on like a one-year deal, then I think probably maybe just stick with Mick, see if there's some progression next year. Antonio is a good option as well. I've come to the end of this video and I still don't really know what I would do if I was in Gunter's position. But let me know below. Maybe you've got a better assertion. Maybe you've got some ideas that I haven't considered for this video. Cheers against Squarespace for sponsoring what I do. I do appreciate all the support. Thank you all for watching as well. My name's Tomo. Thanks again. Have a good one. Ta-da.